So last week uh, we saw uh, this problem of uh, adjusting uh, a model to the data, so trying to find the best hypothesis. In this example we were looking at a linear regression, but we uh, saw how a polynomial regression is also a linear regression. It is as if we were expanding our data into higher dimensions with a nonlinear transformation and then doing a linear fit uh, in that space. So uh, we saw that as we increase the power of the model, we can better fit the data that we have. But if we want to do some prediction uh, about data that we will find in the future, then we start to have some problems like here. This is, it's unlikely that the point between these two would go so far uh, from the data that we have. So this is the problem of overfitting. This is what we're going to uh, look at today. And we're going to start with this notion of how to uh, measure errors and try to estimate the true error for our uh, hypothesis. So we'll see what is this uh, notion of true error a bit uh, in more detail later. But once we have this idea of how we can estimate the true error of our hypothesis, we can try to figure out ways of minimizing this problem, this overfitting problem. So on one hand, we want to fit the data that we have. On the other hand, we don't want to fit it too much and lose ability to uh, predict outside the data. So we're going to see two ways of trying to mitigate or avoid overfitting. One is trying to select the best model, so this trade-off between a model that is too flexible or is too inflexible. And another is to uh, use a model that can be very flexible, it doesn't matter, but we change the way we train the model, that is, we change the way we find the best hypothesis in order to mitigate overfitting. And this is called regularization. The first one is called model selection. <coughs> so let's see how we can do this. First, we need this notion of, of the error. So our goal here in a regression or in classification, which we're going to see uh, after the break, is to find this function, this function g, that is a function of the features of the data that we have. So the features are those x values that we're going to use to predict the y values. And is also a function of the theta, which is, uh, represents a set of parameters that we can adjust. This is how we represent the hypothesis class. We have this model that has some parameters, and as we adjust the parameters, we move from one hypothesis to the other. And we want to find this function that will approximate some function that exists in the universe somewhere that makes uh, the uh, y output from the x value. So we need this function that can uh, allow us to predict y from x. And we're going to find those theta values based on a set of examples that we know. So this is uh, our data set. We have pairs of x vectors. They have uh, the, the features that we uh, can observe in order to predict y. But they also have y already observed too. So in the future, we want to predict y from x. But in order to find the best hypothesis and, and train our model, we need a data sample where y is already determined. This is that idea of supervised learning. So the training error is that error we measure on the training set. We saw this uh, uh, last week. We have uh, the same data set that we're using to adjust the model. We are uh, trying to adjust these parameters by minimizing the error. So we keep measuring the error as we change from one hypothesis to the other. And we stop at the hypothesis that has the least error. So this is the training error. The problem is that the training error is not a good estimate of the error we will have when we use our hypothesis in new examples. And this would be an illustration of that. The training error here is very small because the, the line passes through the, the data point. But probably the error outside this data set would be large here. So we cannot just use the training error because we would be underestimating the error uh, that will occur in the future. So we need to measure the error outside the training set. We cannot use the same point that we are using for uh, fine-tuning the model, for fine-tuning the parameters and finding the best hypothesis. We cannot use those points to estimate the error. So we can do this and split the data into two sets. We can do this at random. 
One, we call the training set because it's the set of, of points that we're going to use to adjust the parameters. And then there is a, uh, another set that is left out, the test set, that allows us to estimate the true error. And the idea here is that the true error is the average error we will find outside our uh, training set on all the universe of points that we're going to meet in the future. So if we measured, if we could use our model and test our model in all possible infinite number of points, the average error there would be the true error. Yes? Okay, so, well, you, you can, um, uh, the question is about how many, uh, what is the percentage of points we will use for test set and for training set. This uh, is a bit dependent on uh, the, the actual problem, because uh, uh, in theory we would like to have as many training points as possible, because that would reduce overfitting and as many test points as possible because that would give us a better estimate of the, the true error. Of course, we cannot do this, so usually uh, a common way of splitting is something like 70% training, 30% test, but it depends on how many data points you have. If you have very few data points, you may not even be able to do a proper test because then you're, sec you're uh, making your hypothesis worse because you don't have enough points for training. If you have many, many data points, then you can use a lot for tests and it, you speed up training because you don't need so many points. So, in practice, there is no real hard rule. It depends on, on the situation, okay? But the, the, the idea in abstract here is that we're going to use those blue points there, the training set, to fit our model, to adjust the parameters, and then we're going to measure the error outside uh, the, this training set. And this gives us an estimate of the true error. So remember, the test error is measured on a set of uh, points we did not use to adjust anything, so that we can use to uh, estimate the true error. But the true error is something we do not measure, because the true error will, would be the average error over all the universe of points, and we only have a sample of that. Another important thing is that if we distribute these points at random, we will get slightly different results depending on which points fall on the training set, and which ones fall on the test set. So we are actually sampling a distribution of values when we are estimating the test error, and we will obtain different hypotheses depending on which points are in the training set. So remember that when we're doing this training, we are actually sampling from a distribution of possibilities. However, we say that the test error is an unbiased, gives us an unbiased estimate of the true error, because even though the test error can uh, uh, give us different values uh, when we run things differently and we assign the points randomly at, uh, 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 in different sets, or if we had a different sample uh, from uh, the data, it will converge uh, in infinite trials, the average will converge to the true error, which is also the average over the infinite number of points. So this is the idea of an unbiased estimator, or we obtain an unbiased estimate, when the value may not be exactly uh, the true error, so the test error does not necessarily correspond to the, true, to the true error, but if we repeat our experiments, we would converge eventually uh, to the, the true error. Okay? So this is an important thing. We are obtaining an estimate of the true error, and as long as we don't use the points for anything, it's an unbiased estimate. Yeah? So, so the bigger the, the test set, uh, the closest to the true error, the test error will be? Well, in general, the, the larger the test set we have, the narrower will be this curve. It's still possible to find points far away, but the narrower the curve is, the lower the probability of going too far. It's, uh, it's that law of the large numbers. But the more uh, you average, the, the narrower uh, the interval is. Okay. So this gives us two uh, errors that we can measure. We can measure the training error. The training error is the error measured on the points we use to adjust the parameters of the model. And we can measure the test error. The test error is measured outside the training set using a set of points we, we are not using for anything, for adjusting the model or whatever. 
And so this test error gives us an estimate. It's a random sample of what the true error could be. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yes, that is what is technically called cheating. But I will talk a bit more uh, about that. So uh, the idea here is that the test set is unbiased because we are not using it for anything. We see that the training set is biased because we are choosing things to minimize the training set. So uh, we will see that we actually need another set for that. But the idea first is that this test error gives us uh, an estimate, an unbiased estimate of the true error. Uh, if we run the experiment, we get one estimate. If we run the experiment again, we can get another one because we are using random assignments of the test set. If we get a new data set, a new sample from all the possible data points, then we would get different values. But the idea of an unbiased estimate is that on average, it will tend to converge to the, the true error. But the true error we cannot measure, because this would be the average error over all the universe of points, and we don't have that. There is also another notion here that is related to overfitting, which is the generalization error. This is the difference between the training error and the true error. So the training error may be very low. If the true error is high, you have a high generalization error, which is the error that occurs when you step outside the training set and try to predict something new. <coughs> so, the overfitting, we can see, uh, in this case, this is a plot of these uh, fits here, changing the degree of the polynomial. So, if we have um, a very simple, for example, a straight line, which we would be a polynomial of degree 1, uh, or a polynomial of degree 2, we can see that the train error and the test error are, all, are both very high. So the reason why this happens is because uh, we are uh, in the stage here. You don't see very well the blue uh, color, but in this part, this is called underfitting. Our uh, model is not sufficiently powerful to adjust the data, and so we have something like this. Even though the data points curve in this way, we are trying to fit with a straight line, so we have a large error in the test set, but also in the training set, because the problem is that the model cannot fit the data. So this is called underfitting when you have uh, the uh, error is large in both sets. Then when you go on this side, you, you start to increase the power of the model and eventually the training error is very low, but the test error starts to increase. And this is the problem of underfitting. We are adjusting too much to uh, the data that we are using for training, and then we are going away from the actual shape of the data and start increasing the error outside the training set. And this would be the uh, generalization error. So this difference here, even though we, we, can ma we, can, we manage to make the error very small in the training set, when we step outside, the error is very large. So this difference here is the generalization error. Note that we are actually estimating the true error and the generalization error. This is an estimate because we are measuring the test error and getting an estimate of these errors. We cannot really measure the true generalization error and the true, uh, and the true error because we do not observe them. And you can also see there is a, a, this effect, this uh, sampling effect, that these lines are not necessarily all neat or all growing in the same, at the same rate or something like that. You have these fluctuations because when you run the experiment, it depends on which, uh, which set each point belongs to and which data points you have and so forth. Okay? So there is some randomness here in this estimate. Sorry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This one? No, basically, you, if you look at this, at the, the um, error outside the training set, you can see this, this U shape approximately. So when the, the error outside the training set is high, but the, the training error is high too, you know that you're underfitting because your model cannot even fit well the data that you're using to train it. When they start to spread apart, and especially when the test error starts to increase again, because as you increase the power of the model, you start to adjust better. But at some point, it starts to become worse outside the training set. 
So at this point, you can say you're, you're overfitting. There is no real mathematical definition of overfitting, but this, this is the general idea. You, you can improve things up to some point, but if you go beyond that, then you're making it worse because you're, stri you're fitting too much on the details of your data set and you don't generalize well. And that's the idea of overfitting. Okay, <coughs> okay no, so now let's go to that problem your colleague mentioned, which is uh, we can easily see that the models are not all alike. They do not uh, have the same performance because if we choose one that is too tight, too simple, we cannot even fit the training set. If we uh, uh, make it too flexible, too powerful, then we start having problems generalizing outside the training set. So we could choose uh, the best model here. The problem is how do we choose? We cannot choose based on the training error because this would lead us to overfitting if we choose just the one that has the smallest training error. We could choose the model that has the smallest error outside the training set because that gives us an estimate, uh, measuring the error outside the training set gives us an estimate of the true error of the model. So basically, this point here is one estimate of the true error for this model. This point here is uh, for this hypothesis, uh, uh, in fact. This one is uh, an estimate of the true error for this one, and so on. They are all, they uh, vary a bit because they are uh, randomly sampled from some distribution, but we can use those as uh, uh, an unbiased estimate of the true error. The problem is that if we choose this one because it has the lowest value, now we are cheating. We are looking at a series of values and, and deliberately picking the smallest one. And, and if we do that as, as a procedure, then the estimate is no longer unbiased. Uh, I'll try to uh, explain this uh, in this way. This would be the, the unbiased estimate, the blue one. With, uh, this is the distribution from which we are taking the unbiased estimate. So imagine that you have a six-sided die. Every time you roll the die, you get one number. One, five, four, six, so forth. Those are unbiased estimates of the average that you get on the die. They are unbiased because half of the time they will be over the average, half of the time they will be below the average. So uh, they, if you average out all these die, you will converge to the, the true average of uh, the points you get on that die. But now suppose that your procedure is different. You roll the die three times and pick the smallest number. And then do that again and pick the smallest number and so on. So this is an example of what happens if you, if you from this distribution, you take 10 numbers and pick the smallest one. And then take 10 numbers and pick the smallest one again. You no longer have something that has the same distribution. You have something that has this distribution here. Because since you are choosing from a set of randomly drawn numbers, you always choose the smallest one, you are biasing everything towards small numbers. So if you do that, if you roll the die several times and, and choose the smallest number, or if you uh, try different models, train for different hypotheses, and then choose the one with the smallest test error, that will no longer be biased. So this is a bit uh, complicated, but think about it in this way. Each of these points is an unbiased estimate of the true error for each of the hypotheses. But if you take them all together and always pick the smallest one, the fact that you're always picking the smallest one will bias everything towards underestimating the true error. Because since they, they have some randomness here, sometimes you may pick this one, because, or this one because it's actually the best hypothesis, or it may be because it happened to fall below the true error and actually another hypothesis there would be bad. But since you're always picking the smallest one, you're favoring those that fall below the true error by random, and so you're biasing everything to underestimating the true error. So this is why we cannot really use the test error for doing this, because if we do this, then the t the it will no longer be an unbiased estimate of the true error. And that's the idea of what the test error should be. The test error should be an unbiased estimate of the true error. So what do we do? We need to have three sets of points. If you want to uh, adjust some uh, hyperparameters or select models or something like that, you need at least these three sets of points. 
We'll see uh, next week a more sophisticated way of doing this, but the, the idea is the same. The training set is a set of points that you're using to adjust the parameters of the model and find the best hypothesis. The validation set is a set of points that you're using outside the training set to get one estimate of the true error for each combination of hyperparameters or for each model or something like that that you're trying to choose. Individually, they're all uh, unbiased uh, estimates of the true error, but when you choose the smallest one from the group, you are biasing everything. So, you need the test set, which is a set of points you leave out from all the process, just so that at the end you can get an unbiased estimate of the true error. Otherwise, if you just use the training and validation, then when you reach the end, your estimate of the true error is biased because you chose the smallest one deliberately. So we'll see next week a better way of doing this, but for now this is the general idea. Training, validation, uh, and test. So we can use this to uh, select the best model. So we could use this uh, red curve as a validation set. If we want to have an unbiased estimate of the true error, we would have left out another set of points so that at the end we could check uh, and get an estimate of the true error. This would be for selecting models. Uh, if we select the model that has the best trade-off between underfitting and overfitting, then we can solve this problem and get the best, uh, 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 the best hypothesis for predicting uh, outside our training set. But another way of solving the uh, <coughs> overfitting problem is to use regularization. So these are the two ways in, con in contrast. Model selection means that you are changing the hypothesis class, so you're changing the model, the model is what represents the hypothesis class. You can go from a straight line to a, a polynomial of degree 2, of degree 3, and so on, and each of these represents different sets of curves. Then you choose the best one that has this best trade-off between fitting the training data and predicting outside, uh, so that you can improve uh, your prediction. The other approach is you have one model that uh, usually is overfitting, but you change the way you fine-tune the parameters, you change the, the training of the model in order to mitigate overfitting. <coughs> Let's see an example here. In uh, linear regression, you can use this ridge regression, uh, which is a form of regularization. What we're doing in those uh, regressions, in linear regression, is to try to minimize the quadratic error. So this yt would be the, the true value of each uh, example. The g x theta uh, uh, of, of t would be our prediction based on that set of parameters for the, the input values, the features uh, that we are looking at. So we are summing the square difference of all of these and trying to minimize this one. But we can add a term here that we're also trying to minimize. This lambda is a scaling factor so that we can weight how much that regularization term will influence uh, the optimization. And in ridge regression, this is also called an L2 uh, regularization. We use the sum of the squares of all our parameters. So basically you can imagine that you have a vector of parameters, that theta is a vector of values, and we are trying to make the vector as short as possible. So, trying to keep all the values uh, close to zero. This makes the curve uh, uh, not so flexible and makes it tighter. And the more, the greater the weight we give here, the stronger the regularization would be, and the, the less we allow the, the hypothesis to jump too much, to curve too much. So, this is an example here. This blue line. Uh, was uh, uh, done. This is a, a degree 15 polynomial for this data set, and the blue line was without regularization. So lambda here is zero. We are only adjusting to the data. And you can see that the line passes very close to all the points, but it curves a lot. It goes far away from uh, the data set where there are no points to pull it uh, in the right place. But then this green line here, it was computed using 0.1 in lambda. So we put a small weight here, and now we don't want the coefficients of the polynomial to be too large, because if the coefficients are too large, 
then since we are minimizing everything, it starts to increase the cost function and the, the minimization will try to reduce the size of those coefficients. So by doing that, we force the line to be uh, more, uh, less curvy and to, be, to flatten out a bit. It still has to go uh, close to the data point because we are still using the quadratic error here. But we, cannot, we do not allow very large coefficients, so this green line cannot do things like here and go nearly vertical, as we can see in these parts on the blue line. And then we can increase 1, 10, and so on. At some point, we don't see much uh, difference, but we can adjust the regularization weight here and try to make the line stiffer or more flexible and in that way uh, on one hand keep the ability to uh, adjust to the data to the training data but on the other hand reduce overfitting yeah. you can choose I'll give an example but you can choose the lambda with the validation set you can try different values of lambda and use the one where the validation error is low, smaller. Okay? So, but I'll give an example uh, of model selection and regularization with actual data. So this is, uh, from this site, I took data from 180 countries. The first column is per capita GDP in dollars, and the second column is life expectancy at birth. So we have, uh, if we plot the data, we have this uh, cloud like this. So there are countries with very low GDP. GDP is the x axis here. It goes from zero to fifty thousand or sixty thousand dollars, and then uh, life expectancy from around thirty to close to ninety here. G gross domestic product. It's the the total amount of money exchanged over the year divided by the population. So it's per capita GDP. Okay. So, rich countries over here, poor countries over here, and then low life expectancy, high life expectancy. So this is the, the data set that we have, and the idea is try to fit a curve on this data. So we're going to need three data sets. Uh, we're going to split these into training, validation, and test. Another problem is that we have very large values here in X, and then a different order of magnitude in Y. And if you're doing, for example, polynomial regression or something like that, when you start raising things to the power of 10 or 15, if you start with 50,000, then probably you can, you can get a floating point overflow. If you try to deal with numbers that have uh, very large magnitude differences, then you get rounding errors because of the, the floating point representation. So in general, it's best not to deal with these numbers like this and rescale everything to close to zero, between zero and one, or between minus one and one, something like that. Because uh, there are several advantages. One of them is numerical problems when you deal with uh, very large numbers, very small numbers, or ver uh, numbers that differ very much. And uh, uh, another one is uh, the reproducibility of your approach. So you can have an idea of how much impact a regularization factor of 0.1 generally has and so on if you're dealing with always with the same range of numbers. If you go to a different order of magnitude, then everything else, all those metaparameters will be quite different and you long, no longer can uh, use your past experience on that kind of, of problem. So, and there are also, also problems because it depends on the classifiers, rescaling uh, numbers, uh, input values with different scales can, uh, can work bad with some classifiers or some regression models and so forth. So the general approach is to rescale everything. We do a linear transformation. This is merely as if we were, you were changing uh, meters to kilometers or, or years to decades or something like that. It's just a scale uh, change, so it doesn't change the data itself and we put everything into well-behaved numbers, for example, between 0 and 1. We'll see in, in the next lecture after the break two standard ways of doing this, but for now I'm just going to rescale everything from 0 to 1. So basically we can divide by the maximum value and have everything up to 1. <coughs> so this would be an example of how we can do that. Uh, you're not going to do this uh, when we start actually solving these problems 
we, we have shortcuts in the library things that are already implemented, but I will start by giving you more detailed uh, uh, bits of code so to first really understand the idea and also uh, to show you some examples of Python, how you can manipulate uh, data in Python because this is what we're going to use. So first we're going to create uh, a function here to split the data randomly into uh, different sets. Uh, this is also an example of how you can use the NumPy library to deal with, the, with matrices of, of data uh, in a single go. So we're going to import the NumPy library. This is a, a nickname that is usually given, NP, so that you don't have to always write NumPy when you use the uh, function from there. And we create this function. So this def is to define a function object in Python. You have the name of the function, the parameters, and this column, uh, which starts uh, a, a block of code. In Python, the indentation is what specifies the block of code. So all this indented code belongs to the function. This data here is indented back, so the interpreter knows it's no longer part of the function. So remember that in Python, you need to take care of the indentation because uh, it has syntactical meaning for the interpreter. So we receive a matrix with the data and the number of points we want on the test set. And now we're going to uh, create uh, a list of 0, 1, 2, and so on. This function, a range from NumPy, creates a vector from 0 up to the number we indicate, uh, but stops uh, one before that. So if we put 100 here, it will give us numbers from 0 to 99, because that will give us 100 numbers. 0, 1, so on, up to 99, that's 100 numbers to total. So we get as many numbers, uh, a sequence of numbers with the same size as our data set. In our case, uh, we have 180 countries, so this goes from 0 to 179. And now we shuffle uh, those numbers. So we randomly shuffle everything. This shuffle function uh, shuffles the vector in place. So now these numbers are all in a random order. And we can select from uh, our data. This uh, data matrix has two columns. So it's uh, this, this one here. The first one is uh, per capita GDP, and the second column is uh, life expectancy. And we can specify when we use these NumPy uh, matrices, these NumPy arrays, we can specify which points we want with Boolean mass. So when we do this comparison, the, uh, the rank here, this is the random number. And we compare with the number of points in the test set, we will get a true value for each one that is equal or larger uh, than this number of points, and a false for each one that is not. So we're picking in the position of the matrix where these random values uh, fell that are above the number of, of uh, test points that we want. And then we put on the other uh, data, on the other set, on the other subset, those that fall below. So this is one possible way of separating uh, the data. Of course, this is a bit uh, more complicated. You could actually just shuffle the data and split in two, but it's also an excuse to show you uh, this type of manipulation, because this may be easier further on if you want to separate points from one class or the other, or do some kind of manipulation like that. You know that you have uh, these kinds of things in, in Python, in NumPy. You don't need to memorize this, but it's easy to Google how to do it. Uh, as long as you know that it can be done. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, shape is a, uh, an attribute of the, the matrix object that gives you the length in each dimension. So if you have a two-dimensional matrix, the first uh, value there is the number of rows, the second is the number of columns. So shape zero is the number of rows, shape one would, one would be the number of columns in the matrix, okay? So this is, I'm, I'm creating a, a list, uh, an array of, of values up to the number of rows uh, in the matrix. So this way we can split uh, into two subsets, and now we load the data, we compute the maximum value for each column. This is easy to do with this max function uh, from NumPy. You can give it an array of any dimensions, and specify the axis, the direction in which the max will be computed. So direction zero, axis zero, is along the rows. 
and we are computing the maximum along the road, so we get two values. If you compute the maximum along the road here, you get two values, which is the maximum of each column. And now uh, we can just divide all the data by this vector of two values, because when we do this kind of operation, NumPy broadcasts through all the rows of the matrix. So actually, this division means divide all the rows of our data matrix by this uh, uh, vector. So the first, uh, the first column will be for the first value, the second column for the second value, and this will be repeated for all the rows. So you can easily do this kind of manipulation in Python. Again, the idea is not to memorize this. It's easier if you experiment and look up uh, in Google or, or in, the, in the manual or something like that. Uh, but it's important that you have the idea that you can do these things easily, because then you just look up how to do it and look up the recipe. So now let's split this into three. We get a training set of 90 points, so half our data goes for training. And then the remainder, 90 points, we split into two for validation and test. So we have 90 points for training, 45 for validation, 45 for test. <coughs> and now we can try to find the best model. So this would be uh, computing the mean square error. We have uh, a data set, one of these three the coefficients for the polynomial. We evaluate the polynomial on the x value, so the, all the rows and the first column of the data. And then we compare the predicted values to uh, what the actual values are. So these are all the, the rows on the second column minus the prediction. The prediction is a vector with the same size, so it will compute all these differences then it will square all the elements in the vector and compute the mean. So this is the mean square error between what we predict and what the actual value is. And now we can try different degrees from 1 to, to 8. Actually, this range, you should remember that it stops before the last value you give. If you give only one value, it will give you as many numbers as the number, the integer you put there but it will start at zero. So if you do range 10, it will go from zero to nine. This is useful if you want to iterate through the indexes of an array, for example. If you want to specify a starting point, you can give a, a, a first argument. This is the start and the end. But remember that we'll stop one before uh, the number you put there on, on the maximum. So this will go from one to eight. We will uh, use this polyfit function we saw uh, last week that fits the polynomial using uh, the x values on our training set as the input and the second column as the, the output. So basically we are fitting uh, using the first column as the x and the second column as the y value. And then we're going to compute the error but using the validation set. So see, we use the training set to fit the polynomial, the validation set to compute the error, and now if the validation error that we find is below some very large initial value, we keep uh, uh, the um, coefficients that we found and the error and so forth. So basically, this condition will allow us to keep the, the coefficients for the smallest error and the degree for the smallest error. But this error is not the training error, it's the validation error, because otherwise we would start overfitting. And then we can compute the test error. So this would be the final. Uh, we choose the best uh, polynomial, the best set of coefficients, and we can get the test error from there. So this is the general scheme. One set of points, the training set, to adjust the parameters. One set of points, the validation set, to find the best model or the best uh, hyperparameter for something, and then at the end we use the test error not to choose anything, but just to get an unbiased estimate of the true error. Because since we are using the validation error to choose, this will be biased uh, because of our choice. Okay? And so we find, we have here, you cannot see the numbers, but basically at, with a, a polynomial of degree 3, we get the smallest validation error. This would be the training error, validation error. You can see the slides later. But uh, the degree 3 polynomial gives us the lowest validation error. And this would be the best model uh, if we're doing model selection. 
You can also see that we have different results. For example, a straight line is in underfitting. When you have these very curved lines, then you can see that it's starting to overfit. But this one, polynomial degree 3, is the one that has the lowest error outside the training set using the validation set to match it. So this, we, this would be an example of model selection. We are using the validation set to find the best model, the one that gives us the lowest error outside the, the training set. A different approach would be, yes? This one? Yes, the one point there is not in the train. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have some data also there, the average age is very high. And yes, so this is, this is indeed a, a problem here. One reason for, for these models to vary so much is because that, that point ended up uh, outside the training set. If that point was inside the training set, then it could help solve some problems. But then, in any case, it was a random assignment. So if we were run the code again, we get different results because different points are inside and outside the training set. In fact, next week in the tutorial, uh, uh, you're going to look at this kind of problem. Uh, today, we're going just to start an introduction in Python. But then we're going to look at this kind of problem that occurs uh, especially when you have small data sets. Then things can vary a lot depending on which points fall uh, on which uh, subset. Okay. Yes, th there are some, you can do stratified sampling by saying I want uh, to keep the same proportion of points in these ranges or in the, with these labels, things like that. We will see some, some of those example questions. So another approach, instead of selecting the best model, is to use a model that is overfitting. Okay. Well, it depends. Um, so the problem of, of outliers, this is uh, actually in this course, we will we'll not go too much into those details because those things change a lot in the, uh, depending on the situation. But you can think of outliers in basically in two ways. One is that outliers are mistakes. You are, for example, you, you measured the height of, of a, a sample of people and one of the persons was five meters high. And you say, well, somebody made a mistake writing the number, you throw that number away. In that case, if you think the outlier is a mistake, you should discard it. But in other cases, outliers can even be a very important thing. For example, uh, this country with a very high GDP is an outlier uh, when you look at the cloud, but it's very informative uh, because it's really the, the data that you have. So basically, uh, this is something that we will not cover too much because those things change a lot from uh, from application to application, and this course is mostly about the fundamentals, the understanding the, the basics and, and those things that are that apply in general and so on. But the, the outliers problem is very hard to solve because, especially if you don't know why there are outliers, because it's completely different if the outliers are mistakes or if they are important uh, examples. Okay. So another approach is to use regularization. This is fundamentally different from model selection because regularization does not change the hypothesis class. The number of the, the family of curves you can represent when you use this optimization function is exactly the same because you're just changing the, the cost function. You're not changing the model itself. But regularization helps reduce overfitting by tightening the, the model. Yeah. But it's within the same hypothesis class. Okay. Uh, so consider the hypothesis class of polynomials of degree 4. Even if you force some coefficients close to zero, you're still within that hypothesis class. You don't need to change the hypothesis class. Okay? So if, but if you go to polynomials of degree 5, for example, that's a different hypothesis class. There are curves there that you cannot represent with the other.
Uh, if you use model selection, if you have different hypothesis class, you, ca you have models that can represent different hypotheses that the other one cannot. But with regularization, you cannot change the actual hypothesis that you represent. You're just changing the one you prefer at the end, okay? So the idea is that you, you have the same set of parameters, theta, but you're aiming for a slightly different result. Instead of just wanting the, par the set of parameters that minimize the quadratic error, you also want to minimize the size of the parameters and you prefer vectors with smaller values. So we can do this to reduce overfitting using a model that, is, that has uh, uh, overfitting. Note that using regularization in a model that is underfitting will not make much sense because the model already cannot adjust to the training set. If you further co constrain it by trying to keep, the, the, for example, the parameters small, then it will make things worse. So generally, we are going to use regularization when the model is overfitting. Uh, we, could, we are not going to do this by hand. We're going to use the ridge class for ridge regression, which is this kind of linear regression uh, that is present in, sci in the scikit-learn library. This is the library that we're going to use for, for machine learning uh, algorithms during this course. This is a linear model, the ridge regression, but we can use a linear model by doing first the expansion, the nonlinear expansion, like we saw uh, last week. So we're going to do that. We're going to create this function that receives our data matrix that has the x value in the first column and the y value in the second column. And we're going to expand it by adding different powers of x. So we have x squared, x cubed, x to the 4, and so on. And we're going to uh, add that to the matrix and then put the y values at the end again. So we're going to create a new matrix that has the same number of rows data dot shape zero. Shape is this attribute that gives us the, the length in, its, in each dimension. And the first dimension is the rows. So it has the same number of rows as the original data matrix, but uh, the number of columns is the degree that we want x to be, plus one for the y values at the end. And now we're going to copy the uh, original x values to the first column. This is all the rows column index 0, which is the first one. We're going to copy the y values to the last column. In Python, you can use negative indexes to count from the end. So minus 1 is the last one, minus 2 is the one before last, and so forth. So we're going to put the x values on the first column, the y values on the last column. And now we're going to fill in the intermediate columns with powers of the first one. So the first one raised to 2, raised to 3, and so on, until we get to the degree that we want. So basically, we have a matrix of x, x squared, x cubed, and etc., and then y at the end. We're going to do this. Uh, we're going to rescale, expand, and then split the data again. Eight, uh, 90 points for training, 45 for validation, 45 for test. And we're going to uh, plot uh, the effect of changing that weight, the lambda, on the ridge regression. Note that we have this meta parameter here, this hyperparameter, that we can adjust. And we, it will give different weights to this regularization factor here. So if we increase lambda, we have a stronger regularization. And we are tightening the screws on the model and make it tighter uh, so it cannot be as flexible. If we reduce lambda, then the model can be more flexible. So this is what uh, we do here. We do a loop uh, starting from 0 0.01 all the way to 2. By the way, this link space is a, it, uh, creates a linear um, uh, uh, uniform distribution between the two values. So it gives you a vector uh, that is uniformly distributed between the two of them. Uh, by default, I think it's 50 points that it uses, but you can specify another number. And so now we're going to loop through all those values, compute the ridge regression with our expanded data, and then uh, plot the uh, error on the validation uh, set. So we're going to use the validation set for estimating the error outside the training set, and the training set we use to fit the, the solver. And this is the, the general scheme. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail now for, for the, the solver methods and so on. But the idea is that we create the solver object using this class. Usually, you have some parameters. For example, in read regression, you specify the lambda value there. 
Uh, and then we have this speed method that we can do, use to adjust the model and obtain the best hypothesis. And then you have things like predict to get you uh, uh, input the x values and get the prediction from the y, so you can compute errors and so on. And these are standard uh, methods in scikit-learn. So you have uh, different regression and classification models, and, but you use them all more or less like this. You create the object, you use fit, and then predict or score, depending on, on what you want to do. So this is the result. If we use very low uh, values for lambda, that is, we are not regularizing enough, then we have a, a large validation error. As we start increasing lambda, the validation error decreases. But then, if we start, in, if we continue increasing, we start tightening the model too much. So we're giving too much weight to reducing the size of the coefficients. And now, the hypothesis that we get no longer fits the data very well. So there is an optimum value here. And again, we use the validation set to find the best uh, value and fine tune the training of the model. So this would be the best one with a, a polynomial of degree 10, but with just the right amount of regularization to keep it uh, from uh, moving too much, depending on, on the details of the training set, but allowing it still to uh, fit the data. So to sum up this part, we saw different errors. The errors that we can measure, we can measure the training error and the test error, uh, uh, and uh, we can use the test error to give us an unbiased estimate of the true error. So the true error would be the average error over all the universe. We don't know that one, but we can estimate that if we go outside the training set. The problem is that if we use an, uh, an unbiased estimate for this set of conditions, another one for this one, another one for this one, and so on, even though each of them is unbiased, if we then pick the smallest one, we are biasing everything because we are deliberately picking the smallest one. So this is why we need this validation error. So individually, for example here, uh, each of these errors is an unbiased estimate of the true error. The problem is that we look at this and we pick this one because it has the smallest error and that's what biases everything. So if we want to have an unbiased estimate of the error of our final hypothesis after the work is done, we need to retain this test set that we never used during uh, our decisions in order to have this unbiased estimate. The validation error is individually an unbiased estimate of the true error, but since we are gathering a lot of them and picking the smallest one, we are biasing things, and that's why we need the test set at the end. So remember that error estimates are stochastic. It depends on the data sample that you have and how you assign points to each uh, of the, these uh, steps. And uh, another important thing here is this difference between model selection, choosing the right hypothesis class to get the lowest error outside the training set, and regularization. You start with a, a hypothesis class that is too large or a model that fits uh, too well, that is overfitting your data, but then you force the training of the model to prefer simpler hypotheses and so reduce uh, uh, overfitting. You should take a look at this section 3.1 on Bishop and also these sections in Alpiron and also uh, this is the, the link for uh, a tutorial page for scikit-learn where you have these linear models. So basically if you want to try the examples you can look at the, the documentation and follow some examples there.